You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and I'm joined by this lovely guy I'm again. Stranger. Yeah. How Jared you been, Mouse, boss man? Good. Been a while. It's been a real long time. I'm glad to have you back. Staying busy. You're doing great things. I'm man. doing. You keep pushing out the content. Uh, yeah, three episodes per week for yeah. five months has been That's insane. Awesome. But it's been, it's been a lot of fun. The people I've gotten to talk mm. to from like Joe Love. I got I got to go mm. up there and talk to him about their whole situation. This is now public knowledge. So, cause I had to sign an NDA. They have the black bass stamp now, which is pretty cool that they just launched, which is awesome. I also got to talk to like Martin Gary of the Potomac association mm-hmm. there. That was really cool. So we just keep hammering them out, but I mean, you keep bridging gaps too. I think that's what I like between the fishermen, the angler, the professionals, and uh, you're just bridging gaps in the fishing industry. And honestly getting truth out, I think sometimes it's opinion, but I think a lot of times it's getting the truth out it's not speculation or somebody's opinion it's i hope i'm doing good and not just i think mail, so but we'll see. i maybe, think maybe they're are. both the same yeah, it's a platform like we said it's a platform to to be able to get that information out because sometimes things go unheard too uh, mm-hmm. and so you're you're being very proactive with things and getting the right people on oh and with that said we have the man the myth the legend i've been wanting to get him on on like a yearly basis because he is a rock star in his own right john odenkirk of the department of wildlife resources virginia department of wildlife resources sir thank you so much this has been like a, a couple month thing to get you back in but i'm so happy you're here happy to be back what is a con out of all the papers i i've been reading this past year i keep hearing stakeholder and constituents brought up could you elaborate on what that means when you when you see these papers what is a stakeholder and a constituent for the department of wildlife resource yeah i think mostly they're those are synonyms um to me a, a, a constituent to me is somebody has a fishing license um mm-hmm. because the, i work for that person um a stakeholder might be a, a broader group that might make a stakeholder might be somebody that appreciates the fact that fish are alive in a river but they don't like to fish mm-hmm. they just like knowing that the fish are healthy so i think that that might be a stakeholder but a constituent is somebody that has a fishing license mm-hmm. and, and, and and so i work for that person and then you talked about you know one of your jobs is is to making sure that the fishing is good and what you what you, i'm just going to give you credit until you tell me to give someone else credit what you've done at lake anna <laughs> And Occoquan, because both of those are in your jurisdiction. Holy shit. <laughs> like, are they going to write a book about what you did down there? Or like, I what? would love to take credit for all that, but um, I just watched it happen and enjoyed the ride. <laughs> That's his I, textbook answer, I mean, by the way. That's his, you read that from last time. But. I, I mean, it's just, it's fascinating what... For Aquaquan, first off, oh my God, how can a place like that pump out the weight that it's doing is insane. Like what magic sauce had to come together for that to happen? And honestly, I mean, Aquaquan is probably one of the least managed resources we have. And I know you could argue, okay, maybe we did a few things over the years that helped. Um, hmm. But a lot of it was was not. Um, a lot of it was just the watershed and the changes and the things that brought habs that are now causing the, the problems with the, the blue-green algae blooms. And Anna, which is sort of a different thing, but um, Agaquan, Agaquan is just, it's in a really productive watershed. It's about the right size. It's sort of that Goldilocks size. It's not too big. It's not too small. It's got it, the hydraulic retention time. It's, it's, it's faster than Anna, but it's not like crazy fast, running the river fast. Um, it's got about 10 to 15 years ago, we got water willow, which is what they're trying to plant down a lot of the Southern Virginia, North Carolina reservoirs. Mm-hmm. We had water willow just show up like a gift from God and all of, almost all of our reservoirs didn't have it back 20, 25 years ago. We've got it in Anna now, especially mid Lake. We've got yep. it in Occoquan, Burke. I mean, all our lakes have it, Pelham. I mean, just pick a bunch of lakes. And, and, and I think that how that i don't know how that plant showed up in almost uh synchronicity in, in all these different reservoirs but it's wonderful and, and it's it, and and so I, that's a sort of i think that helped a lot uh, water willow water willow is a native emergent plant it's beautiful yeah, i'll bring up a photo of it um but anyway so, so the, the and the interesting thing about aquaquan is you do have as mentioned earlier a uh, natural uh, self-sustaining population of alewives which is a clupeid and you have the gizzard shad, which is ubiquitous clupeid in most of our lakes where we have decent bass fisheries. So you, you've got a good forage base. So, okay, so you got a productive water shade, you got hydrologic conditions that are right, right. You got a great forage base. Um, 
and you throw in like white perch and some other forwards in there. You've got a lot of woody habitat along the Aquaquan. So you, they throw that good habitat in with the productivity. Uh, and, and so I think what's the, the most interesting thing to me about Aquaquan was for years, everybody knew it was a really great bass mm. lake. Uh, there was a guy named Bob Lynn who was a manager of Fountainhead Park for years. And he was an avid bass yeah, angler. That's what I love. And he used to fish Aquaquan religiously. And he would come down to our office and he would whine about all he could do was catch three to five pound bass all day long. And we were like, you know, what's the problem? so sad yeah. for you. <laughs> and he was like, I want a six or a seven. And, you know, really be nice to get a citation once in a while. And he would just, how come we never have anything over six pounds? Well, I don't know how or why it happened, but about five years ago, maybe a little more, give or take, we started seeing, and I, we haven't done an updated genetic thing in there. So I don't know if there's any, way back, mm. Akaquan was one of the northern, the more northern on the allele scale for, for waterzone bass genetics compared, to, and Burke was too. Um, it was more similar to the Potomac River population. Uh, so whether or not, I don't know. I, I, I can't say if it has anything to do with genetics or not at this point, because I don't know. But, we, we saw the size structure, the, the larger typical range of size structure, largemouth and aquaquan go up. And now it is far and away the best bass lake in the state for quantity and quality. Big bass, 20 inch plus bass, aquaquan. It's taking guys just for, and I got an idea. I'm trying to pull it up, but I got it off the top of my head. It's taking plus 30 pounds. I think it's 36 to 40 pounds to win a six fish tournament out of there. Uh, wow. and it's prime it's bonkers like the weight that's coming out of there and i know sp fishing just caught mm -hmm. i think he said like an eight plus pounder eight, yeah. uh, a couple days ago and then if i can find it there's also a friend of mine mccluskey allegedly caught the state crappie out of there and then tossed it back and called you up about it too it was a white it was a white it was a white yeah it was aquaquan's one of those rare lakes that has whites and blacks we, mm. only manassas is the only lake that that only <laughs> has um that only has both that in my in my, in my work area Okay, down in South Southern Virginia, region two, I'm just region one. I'm sure there's a bunch of them, but but yeah, in Northern Virginia, there's, there's only two, and the whites typically do get bigger. So yeah, that's, but, that's still insane that you have that floating around there. Yeah. Um, is this is this just the heyday for for those two lakes? I, I got to give a shout out to my buddy Con. Con is a fishing machine. He was beat me up. Con's one amazing guy. He teaches kids how to fish. He he decides he wants to catch a, a big carp. And he asked me, where are the biggest carp? And he'll go out and he'll send me two days later, send me a picture of a huge carp. Or he decides he wants to catch a white crappie. He goes to Aquaquan Reservoir, catches a massive white crappie two days later. I mean, he, he the guy's, he's a fish magician magnet. I mean, he's a fishing, unbelievable. So he was, he was, he wanted to catch a flathead. And I told him, I said, well, at Aquaquan, there's not that many to begin with. And if there are any fishing off the Fountainhead Pier. And I said, if, if you want to go down Lake, that'd be my recommendation. Go down there south of Lake Ridge or east of Lake Ridge, get where those big rock bluffs are. I said, you know, probably free line, a live bluegill or something. That, that probably your best chance of catching a flat. He caught one off a jig off Fountainhead Pier. He sent me the picture two days ago. You hit on something else. You have two of the big scaries in there with the snakehead and the flathead. And, you know, lo and behold, mm. nothing's on fire. That yeah, just is fascinating boosting. to me, isn't it? Like how somebody's water just are to, to me the the flatheads never took off in Aquaquan because that that the, I don't to me the habitat wasn't right for right. flatheads in Aquaquan and it went and I don't think the flatheads really love the tidal river the flathead habitat where they seem mm -hmm. to have done the best is what we consider like our more premier smallmouth habitat mm -hmm. right. non-tidal bigger rivers like mm -hmm. the Susquehanna mm -hmm. you know up around uh, the bridge of Harrisburg or the James Abrimo, okay? That's where the flatheads did really well and still are doing really well. Um, you know, if they ever got in the Rappahannock, they probably do pretty well up above I-95. Hopefully they won't, but um, yeah. So to me, they, they never, and they, they've been in the Occoquan system since the 60s uh, and they've never taken off, you know. Is the flathead state record out of Occoquan? It was. It was, wasn't it? I certified a Mike Willems, I think was his name. He brought it down to Locust Shade Park. We were having an urban fishing dedication he caught it that day and brought it down in a pickup truck in one of those car top roof carriers and had it alive because he wanted to take it back and release it, which he did. Is that right? Yeah. Um, but I think it might have gotten beat since then. Um, he brought it down. That's awesome. I always thought about that. I'm not that I ever will, but it's like, what do you, how do you, you need, when you need to certify something like that, 
Yeah, um, get certifying a state record fish is problematic just because it because this has to be on a, a, a certified sort of scale, scale witness. It has to be witnessed by yep. a biologist or has to be witnessed by a department employee and then the fish has to be verified. So what do you recommend? Somebody catches a state record smallmouth, which oh that's been a while, but and they want to release it? Yes. That's really hard. They you, keep it alive. Do basically. a little research for, for where depending on where you're fishing, go to VDAC's website and find somebody that's got a certified scale. Okay. Because they, but you still need to witness. You, well, you, the number one thing is get it weighed on a certified scale. All right, first. And then, and then you make sure you have uh, also the phone numbers of your CPO or people that are local that could meet mm. you at whatever place that is when you're getting it weighed mm. to witness the weighing so that you can take – and then well, no, but So it's not Odenkirk. Don't examined. call Odenkirk because he'll be in the middle of his <laughs> Well, it depends and... when and where. I mean, I have, I've certified, but it just depends when and where. Yeah. Because when that happens, you're, if you did, if you did, were lucky enough to have that happen, be like, oh, you're not going to be prepared. No, like, probably not. No, you're not going to be prepared for that. But it's a state record, kind of like well, I mean, Smith, look at what McCluskey did. Well, <laughs> he I heard, the damn thing. Yeah, well, and I heard too. Well, I think Jim Johnson had a, 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 a citation or a, tro a state record crappy from Occoquan too. And I heard there was mm. the state record smallmouth came out of Smith Mountain. It was a guide. I've got a picture of it, and a girl caught it, and they were striper fishing, and uh, I, he had the scales, but. Didn't get it certified. They didn't take the Smith, time. And I'm I like, think Smith Mountain has Smith the state Mountain. record. How do you yeah. how do you not take the time to do that when you've got a a state record fish? I mean, that to me just seems. But anyway, well, good segue with state records because I think Lake Anna might have a state record here soon. Oh, there you go. You just dropped a dirty Same thirty thing. for for largemouth this past winter for the elite and uh, Lake Anna Elite Series. And I'm series. fascinated because your Florida strain. I don't think that's still not the F1s. contributing. Yeah. The F1s not contributed to that 30 pound yet. Two that's years like, ago were the F1s introduced? Yeah, I thought you were going to bring up the hybrid stripers. Oh, that was, no. oh that's going to come in too. So F1s, yeah, we start, I, uh, I was just looking at some of this data because we have a staff meeting coming up in a couple of weeks and I'm going to be summarizing the F1 data from the study legs. So Ooh. I was, I was putting all mm. my Anna data together and I haven't run it yet, but, um, based on my recollection. So this was our fourth. So 20, 2019 was our baseline. We, we got, we did a genetic and a age structure baseline in 2019 of a hundred random fish. So that was, we got that set off to the side. 2020 was nothing happened. So 2021 was our first year of F1 stocking at Anna. Um, 20, 2020. Yeah. What did I say? 2020, 2021, 22, 23. No, That's no, it must've been, no, because this was our fourth year. And we, so we, we're doing six years total, two years of three different rates. So we have a high, medium, and a low stocking rate. And these were all developed for, based on each lake. It wasn't It wasn't just saying we're, this, this was – because a lot of times you, you see 15 acre, you see some something like that, a stocking rate. These stocking rates of F1 fingerlings, a pure Florida versus a pure uh, northern largemouth, Cross the first generation. That's the pure F1 tiger bass, if you will. Um, those fish were initially stocked in Anna um, in 20 at, I think, the medium rate. Then we went high, then we went low. And then this year we were back to medium, I think. So, but, but the, the rates that were developed to put those fingerlings in were based on traditional catch rates of juvenile fish for each individual lake. Interesting. So, mm -hmm. so we're stocking it. So our low rate is different low rate than Smith Mountain Lake, mm -hmm. right? Which makes sense. It makes sense because the productivity is going to be different in the habitat. <clears throat> How many years did you create a sample size for the catch rates so you could create that data? Oh, the entire standardized list. Uh, okay. Dan Getz was still so Dan Getz is over in Maryland now. He's he's the the good doctor's boss over there. Um, but Dan was a little bit of a, a statistical wizard, and he did a lot of that for us before he left. And we hated to lose him because he was good with that stuff. But he came up, so I sent him. I sent him twenty years of fingerling catch data for Anna. Gotcha. And, and he he threw something back at me and said, "This is how many fish you you because we had uh, shoreline area, and so it was all based on shoreline area and a traditional fingerling catch rate." So this is based on twenty plus years, generally yeah. speaking. Okay, yeah. gotcha. So he threw something back at me and said, "This is your number." And I said, "Sweet, thank you." So what's your medium number? Do you remember? Oh, uh, <laughs> Treating like a I, th I think our low number was like 12,000. And then how much can you say how much? So our high like, number, I think our high number was around 40,000. And how much does that cost? A lot. Um, the, 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 each year it's about a hundred thousand dollars for the study lakes, but we're not stocking all of Lake Anna, right? We're just stocking a little piece in the mid lake, sort of the, what I think of the best habitat area. Um, and then they don't move. I mean, to, to large amounts don't move. 
Um, so, but anyway, yeah, it, it's, it, it's neat. It's a good study. Um, it was interesting. A study was just published out of Arkansas where na largemouth are native. Mm -hmm. See, a lot of these studies where we're doing this, largemouth aren't native. They tried to stock pure Floridas to uh, subtly shift the genetic composition more towards a, a higher percentage of Florida alleles with the idea that that should bring a bigger fish, average size, mm -hmm. top end. Didn't work for them. But they were using pure Floridas, and it was in Arkansas. And Didn't work for them as far as bigger fish. Right. Getting the result they determined they after right. X number of years of stocking. Interesting. And looking at the genetics. I think they were able to get some movement in genetics. I'm, I'm not positive about that. But they, they did. There was no like average size difference in their sampling data or in tournament data. They basically said it, it was not a success in terms of what they were trying to do. And you're all still determined. You all that's to be determined in these lakes, right? Our study but but, lakes. but we're yeah. we're we're not stocking pure Florida. We're stocking F1s, gotcha. which is what we already had in those. Right, 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 right. You know, I alluded to earlier that Occoquan and Manassas and Burke and Potomac, a lot of those extreme northern Virginia lakes had higher percentage of northern alleles. Gotcha. Which kind of makes sense too, because you figure out if the whole state's a bunch of mutts, which it was, because we don't really have well, no, largemouth or native in a tiny portion of Virginia, but most of Virginia, the Chesapeake Bay drain is not native. Hmm. Um, and so what has happened over the years is is what's been stocked is, is pretty much mutts, right? Either in some cases way back in the day, we did stock some pure Florida's before we realized they don't work well this far north. Um, in other cases, we might stock New Orleans. Basically, we stocked whatever we could get because mm -hmm. genetics was much less of a concern in the 1960s or fit, some of these lakes were built in the 50s, some in the 60s, some in the 70s. Um, mm. So there was much less thought given or where the, what the genetics were of what you were getting. Um, and so it, and we, when we did our baseline surveys way back when Tom Gunner was still here and, and, and got those genetic baselines done 15, 20 years ago, they were all mutts. And that's why Vic Desenzo, when he was here, he said, well, future stocking should be F1s because – I mean, that's the most pure of a mutt. You got 50 50. Um, and we've mm. got 30 to 70. Depend and, and, and you went further south, like Briary, you had a higher percentage of Florida alleles. And you also had some bigger bass. You know, so how much did the bigger bass or more southern, more growing days play into that? But to a lot of their points, what's fascinating is I've talked to our hatchery guy, and then I've heard you or somebody else say that, yeah, you know, when you say, well, sh should we put this in this other body of water? Well, eh, you know, your, your regular largemouth will, should be able, can get it as big. And I'm thinking, how genetically speaking, how can you say that? But to your point, if Lake Anna, again, if those 30 pound bags are not that stocking, it is true that you can the the regular largemouth that you have stocked based on good forage and growth rates and and age that they will potentially get as big if not bigger. And I, and I want you to finish your thought about what you found out with your with with the data being that has been collected. But this is something that I had a great conversation about this with the podcast with Joe Love because mm -hmm. it is. I think we need to appreciate that with the F one, it's it's one generation that you're going to yes. see the pop, right? And it is expensive, and it, and mm -hmm. he. Joe said hey, we're a smaller state, you know, right. so it is going to cost more. And I think you just need to appreciate the cost there. Cause I guess Correct. in a perfect world, a perfect world, if money was an option, the Texas way of doing things with their, with their uh, programs or hatchery programs probably is the best thing where you have mm -hmm. the Lunker program. You're getting the genes in that specific climate mm -hmm. that have grown big. You're putting them back into the breeding mm -hmm. program to produce their genetics. But again, it's like, look at the size of Texas, look at how much money they got. Right. So it's just, I think people, when we're talking about supplemental mm -hmm. stocking, understand the That's price tag that comes yeah. with it and understand the whole, like right the everything about right. it not just a sliver mm -hmm. of it but back to what you're point. saying that's a great point so it takes me back to my early days with the feds when i was down in the apalachicola river collecting striped bass brood stock for this this program where we were trying to get pure gulf strain stripers um we used to have to sit there and count lateral line scales we had, we had a 50 pound female ready to, you know or 45 pound female gravid and, and they, oh, but she doesn't have enough scales on her lateral line. Got to release her. Can't take her to the hatchery to spawn. And what? there'd be a guy screaming, if this fish can grow 45 pounds in this yes. system, we should be saving those yes. genetics. And so yes. how do you, you know, yes. so that's exactly what you were just talking about. But anyway, so Lake Anna is on fire. Um, and maybe next year, we're going to see some of the first year, those, those will start to show up in tournament bags. They haven't yet. And what would that weight be, you suspect? Uh, if you wanted to make a bag. I, I'll, I'll tell you, but... All right. Um, I, I, I don't have my age data back from this year. I don't have the genetics data back from this year, but I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say they could be fives. Fives. And how old are they? 
those would have been the 2020s. Wow. That's impressive. That's, That's impressive. impressive. And then you just had a brand new stocking that, that, that just took place this year. Let's, let's talk about that a little bit with the, the hybrids. So well, that was just last week we put our annual stock in of hybrids. So we finally settled after tweaking with the stocking rates of the Moronis, which are Moronis, the, the genus of striped bass and hybrid striped bass. So I call them the Moronis. Um, we played with that for a long time. I, I played with it primarily. I'm trying to find the right rate. You know, Dan Wilson down at Smith Mountain, he's, he's, he's correlated the, 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 the right rate with a gizzard shad abundance. Because if your gizzard shad abundance gets too low, your striper growth mm. goes to crap. So, are, are gizzards the primary <clears throat> pelagic forage species compared to threadfin and, yeah. and blueback? Okay. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the biomass of gizzard versus the others is, is vastly hmm. higher. And, and they, they're, they're, they tend to be a little bit more uh, reliable, I guess, of forage. The thread fins can cold stress, and, and which we haven't had much of lately, uh, but we can have a big die off of those given conditions. And the bluebacks are really spotty. Uh, and, and honestly, they don't get that big. I mean, you know, 20 pound striper is not going to eat a, a four inch blueback typically. You know, they're, they're going to be eating a 10, 12 inch gizzard chad. Hmm. And, and that's how they get, you know, and adding on those poundage. But. Hmm. So, yeah, so it, for finally, after many years of, of, of hustling this, I, I settled down about, I guess, about four years ago with a, a formula. And, and granted, Anna is getting warmer. At some point, we're probably going to have more overt symptoms of, of how os inhospitable that really is for pure stripers, you know, fish kills, fish that look, you know, we haven't seen a lot of that lately. So that, or ever really at Anna, which is good, except for the acid thing in Contrary Creek on the rare summer thunderstorm after drought. Uh, but um, we haven't had like the clayer problems or the problems of Cherokee Reservoir in Tennessee, where you've got the real thermal squeeze, the Chuck Coutant that, that sort of defined that classic striped bass uh, reservoir phenomenon in the 80s, where you know that as an adult grows, its habitat needs change and it has to have that cooler, uh, higher oxygen water that most southeastern reservoirs don't have in the summer. And it's different though. And so part of that is is that the weak stratification because of the the, the, the circulation pattern, it's the intake and then the, the discharge and the whole lower half of the lake's kind mm -hmm. of dominated by that. And then the upper part of the lake, because it is sort of more riverine, it, it doesn't have a real strong stratification. And I, I think a lot of that goes into why Anna survived as long as it has as, as a pure striped bass fishery without faltering too badly. You know, the growth is terrible there for pure stripers. And that's been documented. It's about the lowest in the southeastern U.S. of any lakes that we looked at. Hmm. Dan Wilson and I had a study a while back. Um, hmm. But it, it muddles through, right? It's not bad for what it is and where it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's no question. Uh, Walter Villa did a, a correspondence project for Colorado State Master's Program. And he, he documented, mined all our data and Dominion's data that we've collected on temperature. And there's no question the temperature is going up in Lake Anna very, very gradually, but it's going up and it's probably going to continue to do that. And at some point, the stripers are going to say, you know, they wave that white flag and say, it's too hot for us, fellas. And, and that's why it was so important to start getting the hybrids in there because they do much, much, much better in that habitat and they'll tolerate that condition. Mm -hmm. And and I think we're going to see a monster fishery. I've already seen it developing. And I, I, I just, that's really fun to be a part of and see what is I think going to be produce a state record here? Probably that's 2024. I'm going to limb. What's the state record? I, I think now. it's got to be 16, 16 hmm. and change. 16 and change. It's about a pound or two bigger than the current Anna record. So we're we're within reach. There's wow. been a couple state records. The saw guy was just broken mm -hmm. at Gaston, but then I think there's a saw guy caught at Lake Anna this year, past year too, if I'm not Some mistaken. Monster saw guys, yeah. The, the first year class of those was 13 and those are pretty much gone at this point, but we do have some more year class. In fact, we, we have a, we have, we have a group of fish in there that are barely two years old and their arms legal already. 18 <sighs> inches. That's insane. Wow. It, they are growing. Like I've never seen fish grow. They might be growing faster than snakeheads. <laughs> and to that back to your tomato aqua, and that's not always been in Lake Anna. Like, mm -hmm. you know what, what I'm saying? Like the guys? growth rates, no, just overall growth, overall rates, growth rates and just the, the, <clears throat> how well it is right now. And like what is to yeah, his okay. question earlier what's the contributing factor there like i well, mean anna anna's getting to my mind okay yeah. so, so that's what he won't factor. take credit so, <laughs> so it's like so there's a paradigm in, in in the world of of uh reservoir aging and fisheries and, and and most of that holds that anna's a half a century old now right, right? okay and, and most of that holds is, as reservoirs age they get less productive and they need a lot of tlc and huh. stuff to to and then, but you're never going to be 
like where you were back in the glory days, which is, you know, 10 to 20 years, probably post post filling. Um, but for a lot, I don't know, you know, I can't say for certainty for why, but I think part of that at Anna is, is what we're seeing now is being so good. And the fishing end of it is we're also reaping the negatives on the harmful algal blooms and the Virginia department of health guidelines and, um, uh, advisories about water contact. We're having the, the blue green algae, AKA cyanobacteria blooms that produce a toxin sometimes. And, and that's when we have the health advisories for like dogs getting sick or people, you know, getting skin rashes or whatever. Um, and honestly, some of that might have been there. I think right now we're looking or harder than we ever have been because now we know it's a potential problem and the standards may be a little different than they were. So I'm not sure on that end of it, but I, I can say that there's no question that Anna is an extraordinarily productive system for fish, for growing fish and, and, and for, you know, mm -hmm. a, a producing a great fishery. Mm -hmm. And, and so part of that is that it's an, it's a very nutrient rich system. We talked about yeah. eutrophication, but because the hydraulic retention time is, is about a year in most estimates, you know, the, the water in the upper end of the lake, you go mm -hmm. from a system that's, it's, it's mm -hmm. turbid. It's, you know, the, the visibility is mm -hmm. inches versus down at the dam, right. where it's 20, 25 feet. So basically it's distilled water down here mm -hmm. and it's pea soup up here. In mid lake, you almost have a perfect scenario. Right. Hmm. And, and that's my contention. And that's where I tell people to fish. Interesting. The mid lake from the right. state park splits up, you know, a third of the way on each arm mm -hmm. down to 208. That's, that's the sweet spot for me. And like, yeah, not to say you can't catch fish down lake and way up, they're there, uh, but the best nexus of habitat and productivity mm -hmm. is that mid lake region. And that's where we're stocking the F1s. That's where we see our highest catch rates of pretty much most species. Hmm. Um, and, and we do our spring shocking. That's the best for size and numbers for largemouth in that hmm. mid lake region. Mm -hmm. Typically with the water willow uh, in the spring that you're looking for that near the drops. Um, is the, the number one. So that water willow is good for the fishery. Oh, I mean, that's one of the, it's okay, that's massive. awesome. It's phenomenal. It absolutely is phenomenal. And then you look at what's happened with the massive overstocking of grass carp that occurred in the early 1990s when they right. Dominion Power because they were fearful for their intake, for their plant operation, for, for mm -hmm. legitimately. Mm -hmm. um, the hot side, 3,400 acres, probably was over 50% coverage with hydrilla. And so they stock grab massive stock. And I don't remember exact numbers, but it was a lot by the book. It was way over, over the top on the hot side. Immediately those fish were many of them over on the cold side where they proceeded to annihilate all the hydrilla on the cold side. That wasn't really a target of the grass carp stocking. And it took the better part of two decades for us to start recovering, uh, two that, decades. any aquatic vegetation, um, it, it, everything was gone. And, wow. and honestly, that was about during that period is when water willow started showing up in a lot of lakes. So whatever that mechanism was, as the grass carp started to die off finally in Lake Anna, and that was it, probably about the time that water willow was showing up. Hmm. And we started seeing, I do it used to do it, not, not so much lately, but a fair amount of diving on Lake Anna around the artificial really? habitat structure we, we would place. And typically um, diving in 15 to 30 foot depths. And, and, and over that time, I was beginning to see Southern Naiad and other species of native aquatic plants reestablish themselves and that got more prolific. And, and then finally, uh, about six or seven years ago now, we saw some hydrilla finally come back. Uh, and of course, that was met with some, you know, consternation among some groups at Lake Anna. And, and that's when we were able to work with LACA, Lake Anna Civic Association and LAC, the Lake Anna Advisory Committee and uh, Doug. Um, Doug Smith, I believe was his name, was really instrumental at the president of LACA at the time for working with Dominion and us and some anger groups to produce a document, um, a plan to try to manage hydrilla in a little bit more sensible fashion mm. um, using integrated pest management, both limited stockings of grass mm. carp and some limited herbicide treatments to hit the sort of squeaky wheel places where people really didn't want those plants to interfere with whatever swimming or boat access. Uh, and, and I think so far we've been pretty successful. I mean, you're never going to make everybody happy, mm -hmm. but I think so far, you know, we still have some aquatic plants in Lake Anna. We're controlling it using the two mentions, uh, two method I mentioned. And, um, you know, so far, uh, things seem to be going pretty well there. So I, I think part of that, part of this resurgence of this habitat 
whether it's SAV or emergent grass, both played a, a role, I firmly believe. And, and, and just sort of um, the, 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 product, the productive nature of the watershed and the forge base that we have there, it was, these things all came together at about the right time. And it was almost like almost a new reservoir sort of. So I, I think we shifted the scale a little bit, you know, yeah. we, we extended that, that sweet spot, you know, from 10 to 15 years out, maybe 15 to 20, 25 years, 30 years out, hopefully. Um, so we're going to ride this wave, hopefully for an, a, a while, mm -hmm. a few more years. And then, you know, and nothing stays up forever. So we'll, well but the fact you're all continuing to stock and just continue to monitor it and yeah. manage it. I mean, that's, and yeah. I, I was thinking earlier, like what a task to be kind of overseeing a management process of a lake like that and just all that goes into it. And that's, it's pretty, and it's cool. And it's good to see the success that comes right. from Absolutely. it because it is, yeah. it's talked about. And like you say, that 30 pound mm -hmm. sack and what's the future hold and all that good stuff. You brought this up and, and before I ask that question, I'm asking another question, which is um, I was when it comes to the algae blooms, I was reading this paper that I found that talked about potential positive effects of SAV and deterring or limiting those algae blooms. Is that something that when you're talking about the algae blooms that happened on Lake Anna, is that something that will hopefully limit how bad those are in the future? I believe so. Mm -hmm. I really do. Uh, because it's just, I mean, it's mm -hmm. intuitively, yeah, yep. right. In in one, so I, there's a guy named Reed Green. He's a retired fisheries uh, biologist, but he's he was really strong in, in his chemistry, and he worked for mm. um, for the Corps of Engineers Waterways Experiment Station, I believe. And, and he's he's really smart too, and and he looked at a lot of the data that we had for Anna, and he's convinced that Anna is sort of the, the, the perfect vessel for these halves because of its bathymetry, because of the watershed and the legacy phosphorus that's been deposited in that lake for 50 years from ag use. And, mm. and then all this, this wakeboarding that's happening and, and, and this constant resuspension. Add into that the weak stratification. The stratification mm -hmm. is a very strong phenomenon and will prevent mixing. But when you have a weak stratification pattern, and you have eroded shorelines from waves and wake action, and then you're constantly resuspending this material because because the, the nutrients and, and and the algae and the things that, that feed on the nutrients it, they they have a a, a, mm -hmm. a dial cycle, and and in in certain t times of the day they're supposed to be certain places in the water column. If you're constantly mixing these things and stirring this pot, um, you can have bad things happen. And I, and I think that that's what Anna has happened in Anna is because of the 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 things that bring us some of the good are also bringing us some of the bad and the bad is these excess nutrients that for a long time didn't have a vascular plant like hydrilla to 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 lose mm -hmm. to get bound or use that phosphorus and nitrogen those nutrients to go somewhere more productive if you will they're going to go somewhere less productive whether hopefully it's a phytoplankton bloom but more often than not lately it seems to be a cyanobacteria bloom uh, and then we get the halves so um, the idea that we have is that the, the, the higher the plant be beneficial plant volume, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's hydrilla or Southern Nyad or Cara or water willow, um, the, the, the more beneficial plant volume you have, the less of that legacy phosphorus is going to be found mm -hmm. in going into. And, and I think that's important for all the homeowners that, that mm -hmm. don't fish, but they, they want to have that, that mm -hmm. pristine lake and it's not a swimming pool, but mm -hmm. if you want to have that high quality water, mm -hmm. you do need aquatic vegetation. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's interesting when you, when you hear people that aren't with the slang mm -hmm. that they want to call it a, 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 a weed mm -hmm. or a nuisance mm -hmm. versus, you know, it's a part of, of the environment. It's no different than if you have what you need for, to grow big bucks right. or to have homeostasis in the woods. It's the same thing with aquatic vegetation. It's it's needed and has its place. And I love like wakeboarding, water willow. It just, even that helps with, with erosion issues. Well, and it is. Yeah. And I think too, I'm like, we're starting to see some come back, you know, like holiday. And I think in the first thing I want to do though, too, is, is positively identify it mm -hmm. just because it's green. Don't tell me it's hydrilla and then map it. And then 
determine, like you were talking about diving, like what percentage yeah. do we have here and wh- where is it located? And then strategically, to his point, manage it. Like mowing your grass, like, yeah. you know, or your weeds, your gardening, you know, if you will. Like it's just, but you that, know, making yeah. sure that we're, but part of it is education, I, to I your think, point. I think that's the Overton window shift that has to happen mm. and, and culturally is mm. it's not whether it's hydrilla or not, whether it right. should be there or not. We should, but we should at first come from the point that you need aquatic vegetation, right. period, to have a healthy system. Mm-hmm. Now the conversation is how much. Right. Not whether, okay, if all we can get to grow here is hydrilla, right. that's it. Do we firebomb the whole place? Is no. that smart? And I, I think that's where I'd want to have the Overton window shift in the conversation. To his point. point too, if if you don't want it off your dock, because you don't want to tickle in your toes when you jump off and swim, then let us know and we'll come over and right. take care of that, whether it's a heavy mat or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like let's let's manage it like you're saying. Because right. there are pockets, truth be told, there's pockets in deeper water, in 15 foot of water, that people don't even know it exists, but it's there. Right. And so by using these, like he was talking about, kind of selective management. Is, but you're right. It's about educating the person because they're as smart as they can be. They can be very intelligent, book smart. But when it comes to the ecosystem, environment, nature, they they don't know what they're talking about. That's where I'd rather rely on a, on a John or, or, like you say, even some anglers or somebody that has experience yeah. with it. Where can people, like aside from what Thomas is doing, which I think is great, where can people get this information as far as, let's just say Lake Anna, for example, um, the right accurate information about things that you guys are doing. Do you all have like a publication? I know we've talked, we have a great website. But... Yeah. So you just go to our website, you click mm-hmm. on fishing, mm-hmm. click on Lake Anna, mm-hmm. and then there'll be some links on there. One mm-hmm. of them's biologist reports. Okay. So okay. I'm, I'm a little late and you know, I was supposed to update that. I mean, well, every year I do a, uh, a highlights. Okay. It's, it's called federal eight bullets because um, mm-hmm. we, a lot of our money comes from federal mm-hmm. aid sport fish restoration. And so what, some of what we do is, they're, that's funded through there and mm-hmm. so we every year we report on that mm-hmm. and so i've got a two or three page s- synopsis mm-hmm. of and of, of every of major findings from our shocking and our netting and stocking mm-hmm. every year so that's not always on the website but if, if somebody calls me or emails me i can get that to them okay but what is on the website is a biologist report that gets done about every four or five years okay and that's a much more comprehensive mm-hmm. uh, thing about what's going on mm-hmm. and so that's sitting on their and that hasn't been updated in a few years, but I'm, mm-hmm. I'm gonna get on that this off season. And um, but the annual report, any water, my waters, mm-hmm. I'm happy to share that with anybody. I know you're talking about Halliker too in the hatchery because I know that's kind of like in my oh, in my little one, brain yeah. too. Like I just want, I'm anxious. I'm very anxious to hear about it and like what like kind of what he was saying. What's next? Mm-hmm. You know, how's it going? And then what's next? What can we look forward to? You know, down down the road. So yeah, that's no. great. Yeah, yeah, we'll be getting him on the show. Believe awesome. that, but yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. I always love talking to Wealth you. I appreciate knowledge. it. Guys, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today. Again, please like and subscribe to the channel. Please join us on Patreon. Once we hit our goal, guys, we're going to be able to start our own nonprofit here shortly. We'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.